the microphones to be muted for the time being. Uh, dear friends, colleagues from who've logged on and who've registered for this uh, exciting symposium, the second of the APSIC webcast 2020 from the Asia Pacific Society of Cardiology dealing with the practice pearls in interventional cardiology. And as you would note that uh, we are covering nine hours of a time zone from Saudi Arabia, we've got listeners and audience from, Mar Mar from Mauritius all the way up to New Zealand. So it's really exciting to have some of the greatest experts of interventional cardiology here with us uh, who are going to give some practical pearls in tough calls of PCI in heavily calcified lesions. We well realize that uh, heavily calcified lesions is of course a nemesis for us. We don't like it at all. Whenever we see an artery which is heavily calcified, you say, oh no, not me, why am I doing this? And we well realize that nearly 30% of the cases which we do have some moderate to severe calcification, 10% of those are fairly severe calcification. As we do more and more elderly, those with the previous bypass surgeries, those with chronic renal disease, uh, elderly, diabetics, all have heavily calcified vessels. And truly, it's very difficult to deal with heavily calcified vessels. They are prone to perforations, the inability to deliver stent, inability to expand stents, need adjunctive devices to get the best results, and certainly lead to one of the commonest causes of cell uh, stent under expansion. Uh, subsequent uh, worse outcomes with stent thrombosis and restenosis. So really, the, the worst form of, uh, of uh, lesions that we've dealt with. But luckily, we also have advancements in dealing with them. New devices have come in, and therefore it just is apt for this forum today to actually go through the new tools for treating heavily calcified lesions, and then hear the experts present some of their toughest and most difficult or most educational cases, highlighting the management with the use of many of these devices. And actually, whether it's the speaker or whether it's the panelists today or the moderators, we're all one together. Everybody's able to come, everybody's an expert. Uh, it's not just that the speakers are there as experts, actually our panelists are also as much experts at those new technologies as they are. And it'll be an exciting discussion, the way I see it going forwards. It's going to be an exciting discussion, perspective, as well as, a, uh, as, well as uh, question and answers on, uh, and, and tips and tricks coming from everyone I would see who's a part of the meeting today. So with those words, I think I would hand it over to, to Dr. Damras. And uh, Dr. Damras and myself would moderate the first session on new tools for treating heavily calcified lesions. We have as panelists, Dr. Ravina Bindi from Australia, Dr. Zanji Zhang, who's well known uh, from, from China, Ramesh Singh from Malaysia, and Khaled al Faredi, my dear friend from Saudi Arabia. And with that, uh, I would also just, before I hand it over to Damras, I just introduce to you uh, Dr. Kassisi, as well, because uh, Salvatore Cassisi is from uh, Munich in Germany. He is a graduate of uh, Naples School of Medicine and has been a postgraduate also from the Naples School. He is uh, head of department at the Munich uh, Heart Center. He's published a lot. He did his PhD also uh, in Naples. And then of course, he's, he's an expert in new tools for uh, dealing with calcified lesions, especially uh, the talk he's going to give on the pressure balloon. So uh, over to Dr. Damras, over to you to take the sessions forward. Yeah, thank you, uh, Ashok. We have uh, two speaker, outstanding speaker for this uh, session. So the first one is necessarily uh, where he talked on the, uh, the, high, the high pressure balloon inflation for calcified lesion. Please, uh, you can go on. You have uh, 12 uh, minutes uh, for presentation and eight minutes for question and answer. So I, hear, uh, I hope you can hear me, everyone. Yes, we can, we can hear you. I'm, I'm, very, I'm very honored uh, uh, for the presentation from Dr. Seth, Professor Seth, and from the kind words 
from every one of you. Uh, thanks for having inviting me. Uh, thanks for having the opportunity to share the experience of my center, not my experience, of my center uh, with uh, these kinds of lesions, as the professor said already uh, told us. And uh, I will start for the audience with a, something that is going to remain in our heads more than a lot of words. This is a common ostium of a lady that presented at our institution with a, a tight and very calcified, this horrible stenosis uh, the professor said referred to. And uh, uh, the lesion was placed on the distal left main, if we can uh, tell this left main, and it was extended in the LAD and uh, uh, on the left circumflex. As you can see, there was an extensive rotablation. This was the seventh run, run of a rotablation in this vessel. And as you can see also with the guiding uh, extension device, uh, with the uh, um, CTO guide wires, it was possible to cross also uh, the LCX in that way. And then we achieved it after the post dilation with the high, super high pressure, but ultra pressure, but we achieved a satisfactory result uh, with the implantation of three stents. This is a, a, a paradigmatic case because, you know, uh, there are a lot of people which present in our uh, daily practice with uh, uh, this proportion of uh, um, calcified lesions. And you can see that the more severe the calcium, the worse is the outcomes. It's not a matter of uh, 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 we don't like to make these lesions. These lesions are important also for the as a pronostic uh, um, a parameter to evaluate how good our patient will uh, uh, do. And uh, this is a bullet analysis for true randomized trials, horizon semi and acuity. And you can see that the presence of moderate to severe calcification in the coronary artery tree was associated with a higher risk of all the components of a, a worse outcomes all cause mortality, cardiac mortality, myocardial infection, target disease, vascularization, and maze. And this was published last week, or last two weeks, on drug intervention. This is a pooled analysis of 80 randomized trials of drug eluting stem, and it was possible to demonstrate that the more is the calcium, the worse is the outcome, and the contribution of new generation device on improving the outcome is not that much high that we expect. So for this reason, is important to have the best technology to manage this kind of patient. Why is it important to uh, uh, um, have the best technology? Because if we could prepare adequately the lesion, if we could expand adequately our vessel, uh, it is important, it is much more important if you have to deal with calcified lesion because calcified lesions are uh, the enemies of the stand delivery and expansion and they could damage this polymer encoding during the delivery. And for sure, all these things together uh, uh, lend to an inadequate diffusion of drug to extensive calcium marks. And these have a directly, uh, uh, directly impact uh, the, uh, effect in the, <clears throat> sorry, the effectiveness of drug eluting stents by increasing the risk of stent thrombosis and breast stenosis. So this kind of lesion, the professor said, um, um, told about uh, calcified lesions, but the calcium is one part of this problem because the calcium uh, is a part of the resistant lesions we face in the daily practice, and uh, uh, also the lesion with death and the expansion belong to this kind of lesion, those with multimetal lyrate instant restenosis or death thrombotic uh, lesions and non dilatable lesion, dilatable lesion after rotablation. So how we have to deal with this is the armario, the normal armario we have to face, uh, with which we have to face this kind of lesions. Uh, for sure, standard balloon angioplasty are not adequate because they increase the diameter with the greater pressure. They have a nominal diameter typically at six to 10 atmosphere. And you know, they are associated more than other device with the dog boning effect. It means that the stem expand uh, the, sorry, the balloon expand on the and the, the distant part, and proximal part, but where the lesion is, the balloon does not expand. Non-compliant balloon are a little bit better, but unfortunately, uh, they are for sure more resistant to plastic than semi-compliant balloon, but they are not every time the solution. Just another case, a patient who presented at our institution with extensive di um, uh, calcified proximal LID a tight stenosis also of the mid part of the LAD and the aneurysm in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the place where the stenosis is. We decided to rotablate it and take a look. A lot of people 
uh, say that after the retablation, the balloon, the non-compliant balloon could for sure expand. But take a look what happened. The balloon ruptured. And as you can see, at 24 atmosphere, everything that is inside the balloon go outside. It means that it can uh, uh, embolize air, contrast medium, and nitro. So in the next slide, you can see that the patient was hemodynamically instable with some uh, uh, AD block, and the LED occluded abruptly. So what we did, we go, we went with the guide wire in the LED, and we started a non-compliant balloon dilation at 24 atmosphere in the LED. But I will perform a magnification dog boning effect. So we have two problems: the balloon in the non-compliant balloon in the forcing part of LED ruptured. The balloon in the uh, mid part of the LED as a dog boning effect. So we need something else. And the something else could be, in my opinion, the ultra or super high pressure balloon. Twin layer technology, it means that there is a balloon within a balloon and you can expand the vessel more precisely, more rapidly, because there is a uh, stable uh, growth of uh, or minimal growth of the balloon between 10 and 35 atmosphere, there is a minimal growth of the balloon. It means that you cannot damage the vessel that much. And as you can see, we perform the pre-dilation of the LID with a 2.4, a 3.0 uh, full tri pressure balloon at 40 atmosphere. And then we expand the vessel. We complete the preparation of the proximal part of the LID with the 3.5 OPN balloon at 35 atmosphere and then we achieved the goal to perfectly explain the stand and to implant it. So, which are the use of this kind of balloon? For sure, the calcified lesion, but also the problem associated with stent implantation in calcified lesion. Take a look at this stent and their expansion that was associated with the same thrombosis. The patient presented at another institution. They sent the patient to a bypass operation. The patient refused the bypass operation and was transferred to our institution. We fixed it at the first the LID and then we crossed the almost occluded stent with the non-compliant balloon. Again, take a look, non-compliant balloon at the maximal atmosphere, again, dog boning effect, no expansion of the stent. For this reason, non uh, OPN, it means ultra pressure balloon at 45 atmosphere expansion of the stent and the best. stent implantation, very good results. So uh, for sure another uh, uh, possibility uh, for the uh, ultra high pressure balloon is to expand the vessel once the vessel has a occluded or as a restenosis. Take a look at this patient presented at the Tower Institution, a gentleman, very young, already multi metal lyrate instant restenosis. The last one was occlusive instant restenosis. It was treated with recanalization, OPN, uh, it means ultra high pressure balloon at maximal atmosphere, and then three drug eluting balloon were used in order to avoid further uh, metal in this vessel, and there was a satisfactory result. And for sure, the stent under expansion due to calcification of fibrocalcific lesion is a matter of a big importance in the daily practice because the more we implant the stent, the more we face the problem of the stent prestenosis, and stent under expansion is one part of this problem. And we are uh, try, uh, we are starting with the multi-center registry in which we face patient with, uh, uh, wrong, sorry, patient with destined stent stenosis. We prepare a standard preparation with non-compliant balloon, whatever you want, and then we will perform OCT. In case of a stent expansion below 0.8, that is recognized as well known as the, the um, um, the, the, the objective of every good stand expansion, we will prepare again the vessel with OPN before using a drug eluting balloon. Then we will for OCT, and then we will see if the uh, satisfactory stand expansion has been achieved and which is the importance of this angiographic or imaging endpoint on clinical outcomes. A lot of people ask me, can we use OPN or ultra pressure balloon after rotablation? Yes, you can do. A, a, a lady that was transferred to our institution because in another clinic was attempted to make this kind of dilation of this very uh, calcified lesion, and it does not succeed. For this reason, we started with the rotablation, very uh, difficult to cross the lesion, and then we retry with the non-compliant balloon, no 
possibility to expand the vessel. And then we switch to the OPN balloon, the ultra pressure balloon. And you can see this slide is, I think, the most important slide, the progressive dilation of the vessel. Do not use a lot of force. Be careful, but try to increase gradually the pressure with this balloon. These lesions are uh, uh, there since a lot of years. You cannot achieve a very good expansion in a few seconds. So take your time, progressive dilating, and uh, achieve a very satisfactory results. And for sure, we use also the, uh, 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 the balloon also to lesion preparation uh, and also in a uh, uh, patient which have uh, no possibility uh, to uh, um, be prepared in other way. You can see this patient was transferred at our institution because we are a referral center for a very difficult uh, complex high risk and indicator procedure. Distant left main, uh, very diseased, a lot of calcium, no option to bypass because there is stent uh, preceding uh, um, previously implanted up to there, chronic occlusion of distant LCX and almost occluded uh, RCA between two stents uh, that had been implanted in the past. So the first thing we did, we gave um, a little bit more flow in this um, vessel. It means that we performed, first of all, a uh, rotablation of the RCA, and then we scheduled the patient for a staged procedure, and the patient uh, performed this staged procedure uh, a few weeks later. You can see still there the uh, results after the first uh, intervention with the OPM that was expanded up to 35 atmosphere and the patient went well. This is the final result. And a few weeks later, the patient presented again at our institution to complete the revascularization. And you can see this was the vessel that we have to treat. This was the control ancho that we performed a few weeks later. You can see that is a reversal of the collateralization for the LCX. Here, the LCX, due to the, the disease of the RCA, was anti-gradually reperfused in this way. And after a few weeks, by opening the RCA, the LCX was reperfused retrogradually. So what we did, we performed the recanalization of the LCX, and then uh, uh, we faced the very, very huge and calcified disease of the distal left main with a super high pressure balloon by using two guide wires in order to have such a mind of plaque modification with the scoring. So you have no scoring balloon existing on the market that can achieve this kind of pressure. You have this balloon, you put a wire uh, uh, between the balloon and the vessel wall, and you can have a super high pressure scoring that is nothing that is comparable with this kind of balloon. So you can see the final results, complete revascularization. Uh, the patient did very well. And just for you, uh, we used the, non, the super high pressure balloon. Uh, we performed a randomized trial to understand what is the impact of a lesion preparation with super high pressure balloon against a scoring balloon in terms of final scent expansion index. We have completed this randomized trial, a multi center trial, with, uh, with an imaging primary endpoint in terms of uh, stent expansion index, and we and I hope that by the next meeting or the next webinar or webcast with Professor Seth, I will uh, uh, be able to show you the result. This paper is under review in a peer review journal. So, just to give the possibility to the next speaker, my colleague, uh, to talk uh, to talk about the technology of vascular nitrotripsy, I would to spend the last few slides, very few slides on the uh, eventual, uh, the possible uh, uh, concomitant use or competitive use between these two technologies. I will not describe this technology because it will be the mother of the, the next speaker, but I will just, and I will not discuss about the literature available on this technology, but I will just to share with you this patient, a patient that received two steps in the past in the mid LID, uh, sorry, the mid LCA with a huge amount, a shoulder of calcium. You can see it uh, also on the screen that it is a very huge amount of calcium surrounding the vessel. And there was a, a clear stand under expansion at that point. There was a functionally occluded distal LCA, a completely occluded uh, PL. And the patient was referred to us to an option in order to be 
able to expand this kind of stent. We decided to use the shock weight, I mean the vascular uh, intravascular lithotripsy, and uh, in the next slide, sorry, sorry. And the next slide you can see, we used the 4.0 shockwave balloon, 18 pulse, 4.0 is the maximum diameter of the shockwave balloon. And we cannot expand the vessel, but we decided to use a, a 4.5 OPN balloon, I mean, ultra pressure balloon after the use of the shockwave before starting to approach the distal occluded vessel. And we can see that we can achieve maybe together with the shockwave balloon, we can achieve a very good result. And as you can see in the next slide, we had the possibility to implant it, to expand the vessel, to implant a onyx stent 5.026, two uh, jugged stents in the uh, this, um, descending posterior and the distal part of the RCA, and a very good result finally after 16 years of attempt to expand the vessel. So the possibility to a competitive treatment with OPN or shockwave uh, will be the object of another randomized trial. We are starting with it. We are trying to have the funding for it. And we compare in the vascular autopsy against the super high pressure balloon in severely calcified lesion. And then we will have a, a primary endpoint, an imaging endpoint, and I hope to have the possibility to share with you in the next future the results of this trial. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for this opportunity. My conclusions are resistant coronary vision, limit the safety and the fixity of contemporary death therapy is a problem. Balloon angioplasty is limited in resistant lesion because their results uh, and the most part due to non-compliant balloon angioplasty, I'd like to add resulting in insufficient lesion preparation before this implantation. Ultra or super pressure balloon angioplasty can dilate the vessel up to 20, uh, uh, 55 atmosphere. You now have to reach this kind of atmosphere. You have to expand the vessel. And uh, to prepare coronary segment to drug the instant implantation, studies are ongoing. And I think that also vascular lithotripsy represent an emerging technique, very interesting, but in need of further, further investigation. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, because time is uh, running fast, uh, we have a limited uh, the time for question and answer. Very really limited to only, I, I guess, not more than three minutes. So I would ask uh, the first, our first uh, panel, uh, Dr. Ravine, uh, to comment on, on, on Dr. Casari on his uh, lecture, especially for a uh, road beta uh, followed by uh, ultra high pressure balloon. So the Rabine and then follow, followed by uh, Dr. Chang, uh, Dr. Singh, and, 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 and if, if time is if, uh, enough, please. Look, I, I think uh, Sal's really touched on some of the critical challenges we face in the cath lab uh, dealing with calcified lesions. I think the utility of high pressure appropriately is so important. I think we've all, um, utilize super high pressure balloons to really um, overcome challenges. We have in the cath lab are the combination of delivery of the device to the lesion, uh, over getting optimal expansion, and then the risk of rupture and um, uh, subsequent consequences. So I think you've touched really nicely on, um, on, on, on the utility of these devices. Certainly in my practice, and I think the panelists, I'd be very intrigued to see what everyone else in the panel uses. I think we use a combination of super high pressure balloons uh, in combination with ancillary atherectomy devices and lithotripsy balloons now, which we'll hear about. And I think uh, the challenge is um, to be able to do things safely and get the most optimal result. Um, we, for, over, for two or three years, we're using, exclusively using high pressure balloons, uh, super high pressure balloons with results and now that we've got lithotripsy it's changed the safety paradigm a little so i'd be intrigued to hear from the rest of you to see how you choose the various devices in your practice variation dr cases uh, excellent presentation and uh, cases so um, unfortunately in china so far we don't uh, have this uh, ultra high pressure balloon for severe case lesions 
So from your uh, presentation, I have two questions if, uh, if time is okay. So first is uh, uh, how about the safety concern? Because I noticed uh, this balloon can up to uh, 55 at most here. So I mean, is there any uh, vessel uh, perforation of these cases? Another question is I noticed uh, uh, from these seven cases, um, I think uh, almost every case is guided with the angel. So my question is how to sizing the actual balloon? Because according to the study, we all know, uh, if we use the intraconic imaging like Iris or OCT, we can accurately sizing the, uh, the vessel and the selector properly of the balloon. Thank you. Very quick answer. Thanks a lot uh, for your question. First of all, regarding the risk of perforation, a safety issue is important. We recommend in our practice, because there was a learning curve, uh, up to now we have uh, uh, two passive perforation in more than 500 patient treated, patient treated with this kind of device. And uh, in both cases, there was a problem of uh, uh, overdimensioning of the balloon. We suggest to use a balloon half millimeter smaller than the vessel. And it is a safety issue. And you don't have to reach the 55 pressure. You have to reach gradually the pressure that expands your vessel. And for sure, the second answer to your question, the threshold for an imaging should be as lower as possible in this kind of patient. And for this reason, we try also to communicate the importance of OCT because you can see that both the randomized trial we are designing are with OCT. So the imaging should be an integrate part of the intervention of these kind of lesions. Here's a question from the floor, uh, from Dr. Naveen from India to Dr. Kasseri. Uh, he asked about your first, first case, your first case. He asked about the, in, in, instead of a rotoblator, how about if you know, lithotripsy is uh, a, an option for your first case, if you remember, you remember your, your first case uh, from your presentation. That's yes. uh, the question from the floor. Very, uh, very uh, uh, fast answer. Uh, it could be an option, but you can see the extension of the calcium. You know that uh, lithotripsy comes out with 12 millimeter, but I would like to uh, speak about this technology because it is the, 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 the matter of the, it's the subject of the next presentation and uh, uh, the crossability, you know, every device that you use for calcified lesion, you have to base something for the crossability because you achieve another, another uh, uh, because you have another objective. So also the crossing profile of the uh, lithotripsy balloon is not so user-friendly. And uh, also the ultra pressure balloon has a little bit bigger crossing profile as a normal non combined balloon for this reason, we of very, very often, we use the combination of rotablation and super high pressure balloon instead of lithoplasty. Yeah, uh, thank you very much because the time is uh, past now. Uh, I will uh, move on to second speaker, Dr. Michael Lee on uh, intravenous, uh, intravascular lithotripsy. And then uh, for the panel, uh, Dr. Singh and uh, Dr. Khalid uh, will do the the next uh, for the, the for the comment, uh, Michael Lee, please. Thank you, Demras. Um, uh, thank you, um, the Ashok and the Virtual Education Program Committee of APSEC uh, for your invitation uh, for me to talk on the best practices in intravascular lithotripsy for heavily calcified lesions. Professor Seth has uh, addressed this. Uh, we don't really want to touch on uh, uh, calcified lesions because. Uh, they always end up in worse outcomes for the patients. There are more death, more MI, and more uh, revascularization in the future when we see uh, calcified lesions, especially in very severely calcified lesions. Uh, we now uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, very much adopted this OCT-based calcium score to tell us whether the vessel is heavily calcified or not. So what we are looking at is the, uh, first of all, the calcium uh, angle, uh, the arc of the calcium, more than 180 degrees, then uh, you might end up in a worse outcome. And then the thickness, if it's more than 0.5 millimeter or the length of the calcified uh, uh, lesion, more than five mm, 
if you add up all these uh, characteristics together, you will predict a, a much worse stand expansion, a much worse clinical outcome at the end. So these are the patients that uh, we should uh, pay particular attention to and try to modify the lesions. You've heard of the OPN balloon. There are a lot other uh, NC balloons, uh, scoring balloons, and other arthrectomy devices. But today I'm concentrating on the intravascular lithotripsy. What this uh, IBL shortwave balloon uh, uh, um, did uh, was uh, it will actually uh, generate electrical energy by the generator, pass along this uh, catheter all the way to the emitters. And the uh, emitters will actually cause uh, uh, expansion and collapsing of the uh, vapors uh, inside the contrast uh, saline medium. And this uh, rapid expansion and collapsing of the uh, bubbles we create micro explosion and sort of uh, creating short burst of uh, sonic pressure waves. And this wave will travel along the vessel wall and um, cracks, fractures, preferentially the intimal and the uh, medial calcium. What you can produce is uh, through this micro explosion uh, of around uh, 50 atmospheres of uh, uh, pressure which is also more or less equivalent to an OPM balloon of 55 atmospheres. So it's a very, very powerful sort of energy transmission all the way to the calcium. Uh, this balloon is a little bit bulkier than the usual semi-compliant balloon that we are using. Six French compatible. Usually we would choose a balloon to vessel a ratio of one to one. Uh, what we will do is we inflate the balloon at the lesion to four atmosphere and then we deliver the energy, 10 pulses of therapy each cycle and the maximum uh, number of cycles that one catheter can uh, uh, deliver is eight cycles. So after this uh, delivery, we actually inflate the balloon, the eight, six atmospheres and then deflate the balloon and then take the balloon out. Uh, so uh, with this uh, a, a little bit bulkier balloon, we need a reasonable lumen before the, uh, this balloon catheter can pass through. Um, the uh, uh, evidence has been provided by the uh, Disrupt Cat uh, 1 and 2 tr uh, trial. It has shown the device to be both safe and efficacious. Uh, Disrupt Cat 3 is just a global IDE trial. Uh, enrollment has just been completed, and we are waiting eagerly for the results. Uh, Disrupt Cat 4 is the Jap Jap Japanese pre marketing trial. So, a recap of the Disrupt Cat 1 and 2. Um, uh, a reg a registry is that it's shown to be a very uh, effective uh, ways to uh, modify calcified vessel uh, and end up in 100% stand deployment with a high rate of acute gain and low residual stenosis. It is very safe. There's, uh, there are no major uh, complications, including perforation, embolization, slow flow. And if you look at the OCT sub study, uh, the calcium was fractured in more than 80% of the lesions seen by OCT and ending up in full stand expansion afterwards. So how it works uh, is usually you can see it visually when you look at the uh, balloon. Uh, the balloon actually, uh, the calcium will produce a denting uh, of the balloon, but as you give energy uh, with each uh, 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 pulses, then the uh, balloon will get expanded and then you know the calcium has been cracked. If you look at the OCT uh, of the um, vessel after this uh, IBL shortwave balloon uh, angioplasty, you can easily see a deep fracture of the calcium along, the, uh, uh, along this uh, calcium. You see these fractures which, uh, can uh, not be achieved by uh, really uh, many other arthrectomy devices. This will actually end up in a good stand expansion and position at the end of the procedure after stenting. Uh, the IBL shortwave balloon is very good for concentric lesions. Uh, when it comes to eccentric lesions, then uh, it might uh, actually uh, uh, require a lot more energy to, to uh, crack the lesion, mainly because, first of all, the emitter is uh, further away from the calcium, as seen in this picture, as compared to this. And the energy it actually produced will actually uh, be dissipated through the soft tissue instead of reflecting back to the opposite wall like in concentric calcium. 
As a result, more pulses, more energy might be needed for eccentric lesions. However, it has just been presented in the PCLE course uh, in April that when they take up the eccentric lesions in the disrupt uh, CAD1 and 2 studies, you can see that the number of uh, IBL catheters used and the um, number of uh, pulses delivered are actually not much different between the eccentric and the concentric lesions. Sure. And uh, you end up in more or less a uh, similar uh, mean stem uh, diameter, residual stenosis, very, very favorable yeah. result and a very good acute gain. And the maze ray was uh, again very very similar between the eccentric and the concentric group. So this might actually uh, uh, tell us that uh, uh, IVL for eccentric lesions might actually be, be also uh, possible and equally efficacious. Instant restenosis is the uh, Achilles heel of all interventional uh, cardiologists. Is there are not many ways to treat the yeah. yeah. expander stand when they present with ISR. Yeah. Uh, we can use a water plate to ablate the stand, but uh, the, uh, the theoretical advantage of IVL was that it actually can cause less trauma, but resulting in a better result. However, this is still a, an off-label use, and the evidence is, was mainly supported by this uh, uh, different case uh, series, case studies, uh, and the uh, 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 biggest uh, registry I can find uh, is the, this SMILE registry when they recruit uh, 39 patients with very, very complex instant residues. So some, some of them also, uh, already have two layers of stents. But you can see that the number of pulses given for all these patients are actually very reasonable, 56, 57. And the resulting minimal uh, stand diameter was again a uh, very favorable 3.2 oh. a very very with very very good acute gain IVS for ACS and AMI again not much uh, evidence uh, available but uh, there are some case series reports uh, with the use IVL in st uh, ST elevation myocardial infarction and this um, European uh, observational registry uh, uh, show that even though they have included about 30% of patients presented with ACS or AMI, they can actually uh, 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 end up in very similar uh, success rate as well as a very low uh, complication, very low maze rate at the end uh, of the procedure. So again, uh, IBL in the setting of ACS or AMI, especially in very calcified vessels, might be uh, actually also safe and efficacious to be used. Um, nowadays, we more or less follow this uh, sort of algorithm when we come across a moderate severe calcification. So we will look at the uh, imaging result to tell us what the uh, calcium score uh, is. And if the score is uh, low, we can actually simply treat the lesion with a high pressure NC balloon. Or if the uh, uh, calcium score is high, we go ahead, we use the lithotripsy balloon. Of course, as I mentioned, you have to have a lumen to use the lithotripsy balloon. If the lesion is uncrossable or just uh, able to be crossed by a guide wire, yeah, we often will uh, use, first of all, the rotor ablation or the uh, orbital arthrectomy. If there is an optimal result, we can go ahead and do stenting. If there's an suboptimal result, we will add on lipotripsy uh, balloon. We have been using this uh, lipotripsy balloon since May last year uh, in Hong Kong. So far, we have used more than 500 in the coronary setting and about 12 uh, uh, balloons in the peripheral intervention. So we've treated a huge number of different kinds of lesions, diffuse, concentric calcium, osteo lesions, bifurcation, CTOs, uh, STEMIs. Uh, we have used in about 20 cases of ISR with incomplete expansion. Uh, and then combination use, and actually we have also used some uh, uh, in the iliofemoral uh, region to facilitate our TAFI procedure. So this is uh, um, one of the case that uh, we would actually use combination uh, therapy. It's a very uh, tight uh, CTO cross with a wire. There's no way the shockwave balloon will cross. So we use uh, upfront motivation to modify the lesion first and then uh, went in with a 2.5 and a 3.0 shockwave balloon. And uh, afterwards, you can see this deep cracking of uh, fracturing of the calcium, of this deep calcium. And then after stenting, you can see very, very reasonable 
uh, result uh, uh, of standing with good stand expansion and uh, apposition. Uh, this is a huge LCA with very, very tight stenosis, uh, as you can see in the OCT run, very thick calcium, 1.8 uh, millimeter thick. So what we have done is we use an orbital arthrectomy to modify the lesion, uh, low speed uh, uh, at the distal part and high speed pro more proximally, and then two shortwave balloons, 3.0 and 3.5 to further uh, fracture the calcium. And you can see this uh, beautiful fracturing of the calcium uh, at the end uh, of the uh, ballooning. Um, and then after stenting, uh, you can see a very, very good uh, result of stenting and uh, with good uh, OCT results showing us good stent expansion and uh, position. As I mentioned, uh, shortwave for peripheral is also useful to help us uh, with the large bore uh, catheter device. This is a uh, a case uh, uh, use the uh, short wave to short the uh, iliofemoral artery to facilitate uh, impeller support the PCI. And uh, Carlo Di Mario has shown uh, beautifully that uh, it is also possible uh, to facilitate the transfemoral taffy uh, access procedure. And this is our case where we see this a thick calcium, very small lumen uh, iliofemoral artery. We, uh, we have used uh, 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 the shortwave M5 balloon, six by six T millimeter. And then it actually facilitate us to pass uh, through, um, to pass a 14 French E sheath uh, uh, through this very calcified allofemoral artery and then followed by the sapien S3 valve to uh, finish our TAFI procedure. So uh, this is um, our uh, um, uh, 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 flow chart or our uh, summary of when to choose what kind of arthrectomy devices. So when we come to the short wave, you can see that we use mainly for deep calcium, concentric calcium, uh, where all when we have uh, osteo uh, left main RCA lesions, a bifurcation with significant side branch, uh, 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 we have to protect the side branch. And then we would probably uh, choose to use the short wave balloon. So in conclusion, I think calcium is still one of the worst enemies of our, all our interventional procedures. We need to modify uh, this calcium to optimize our result. And intravascular lithotripsy has been shown to be safe and efficacious to modify these uh, very calcified lesions. Uh, imaging is very important, IFAS or OCT OFDI. And sometimes we need combination of rectomy therapy Short wave for the peripherals can enhance our impeller or TAFI procedures. And in the very near future, we hope we will have this short wave balloon to treat our severely calcified aortic valve, aortic stenosis patients as well. Uh, this is our cheap and uh, complication uh, meeting, virtual meeting in November. You are more welcome to come uh, and join us. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. It's very uh enlightening for the, the intravascular lithotripsy, especially for, for some other country that uh, have uh, no advantage of this, uh, using this device. Right. I may ask uh, our two, another two panelists, uh, Dr. Ramesh and Dr. Khalid to give a short uh, comment or, or question. And then we, we go back to both speaker for the uh, something like uh, cost uh, effectiveness of uh, both uh, high pressure uh, ultra high pressure balloon and uh, intravascular lithotripsy for heavily heavily calcified lesion. And, and uh, Damras, Damras will also continue this discussion for another 10 minutes. We don't mind going slightly five minutes extra on this session because I think a lot of clarification from the audience may be needed. We have we had 1,900 registrants for this uh, uh, wow. this Congress. <laughs> So, so please carry on uh, and, and also clarify whatever comes in from the, from the audience. Okay, the, I shall give us a minute. So uh, Khalid, to both speakers, Dr. Kasiri and uh, Michael. Thank hey. you, Dr. Damras. Um, hi, Dr. Lee, how are you? Hi. Yeah, so I think your talk is uh, fantastic. I mean, so easy, Thank so you. clear to understand. Um, uh, well, you know, we all use all kinds of uh, uh, balloons to actually prepare our lesions. And uh, I think lesion preparation is of paramount importance. Sometimes you, you may see on the angiogram, there's not much fibrotic lesion. We should not underestimate our lesions. Um, uh, one thing, one of my concerns with uh, 
IVL is the fact that it's costly. Right. Certainly costly in Malaysia and in Malaysia, we don't have the ability to reimburse that much. And you know, in order for us to use uh, IVL, we also need to prepare the lesion well, and this may incur further costs like OA or rotablation and things of that sort. Mm -hmm. And I believe, and I think I've heard your lectures before. I don't think you have any, you have had any perforations or significant perforations with this device before. I also believe that you use quite a bit of OCT or imaging to guide your balloon size and, and I understand your ratio is one to one. Yes. Now, my concern is, will I be able to cut my cost and not use imaging and, you know, uh, in, and if, I, if, there's, if there is an indication to use IVL, do you think it's safe enough and do you think I can safely size it according to the, the angiogram, a one to one ratio? And you, do you think that's advisable? Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, first of all, um, we haven't really seen a perforation as a result of the use of shortwave balloon. We see sometimes uh, a rupture of the balloon, but uh, it, it, it doesn't uh, end up in uh, rupturing the coronary artery. So it's very, very safe to use, I would say. Um, imaging, I think uh, for us, is very important to tell us uh, the severity of the uh, calci calcification. Without imaging, you won't be able to know the depth of the calcium or the, uh, uh, the, the art of the calcium, whether it is circumferential or uh, eccentric. So uh, the use of um, imaging sometimes actually save us the shortwave balloon. Like if we see uh, 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 just a, a, mo a moderate or the, uh, a very mildly calcified lesion, not to the degree of 180 uh, degrees out of very, very thin calcium, then we can simply use an uh, ordinary NC balloon, scoring balloon, uh, instead of the shortwave balloon. Sometimes it might be a cost saving for us. But um, in case uh, uh, you, you don't have the uh, um, availability of a uh, uh, lot of imaging facilities, I think uh, 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 by angiogram to choose a balloon size is still acceptable. And we see that um, uh, has been done in a lot of the European uh, centers, and it has uh, ended up in very good results. The, uh, uh, the, the, the important point is you see the um, expansion of the balloon. So you, you give the shock, you give the pulses, and then you see the expansion of balloon. If the balloon does not expand, then you give more shocks, instead of treating half-hearted every uh, here and there. So we would like to see full expansion of the balloon before we uh, call it a success. Sure, thank you. Um, my next question is actually, what's the reason the balloon actually ruptures? And in your experience, what are the consequences of a balloon that has ruptured? Does it lead uh, with no uh, slow flow or no flow? Uh, no, um, you know, we inflate a very low pressure for atmosphere and then deliver the, uh, the shock. Uh, sometimes we see perforation uh, during the shock, but sometimes actually it's after the shock when we inflate the balloon to six atmosphere, and then we will see this um, perforation at that uh, atmosphere. Uh, I think mainly because uh, the calcium, some some of the calcium are actually sharp calcium, calcium use they are very very difficult to use, and then it will actually uh, indent into the balloon and cause rupture of the balloon. Even with this uh, rupture of the balloon, uh, we actually have seen very few, uh, maybe two or three. But it, it does not end up in uh, any of the slow flow. It does not affect the flow at all. So luckily, and no perforation of the vessel. Uh, we have seen one uh, dissection of the vessel as a result of this, but nothing really major uh, in the other cases. Before we go on to Khalid, can I just comment on this aspect? Because we've got a good experience of uh, shockwave as well as ultra sure. high pressure. Uh, the ruptures, we've had ruptures of the IVL. When it ruptures during the pulses, it's usually when you've actually delivered 60, 70 already pulses and it's towards the end in a very heavily calcified lesion that it does rupture. But if it ruptures during pulses, it does create extensive dissection. The reason for that is, uh, but not perforation, because the reason for that is the pulses are coming at close to 50 atmospheres uh, while they're encased. But that's the sort of reverberation that's happening. If it ruptures, it just leads to dissection and we've had to cover long segments. When it leads to ruptured, after pulses are given and when we go up to six, 
as we've had in another case. That does not lead to extensive dissections. You just see the leak of the contrast and that's it. So we in, we've had three ruptures and two of them extensive dissections where we've had to really extend the length of the stents by another four or five centimeters. Uh, but they have been innocent ruptures as well. But it's a safe device. It's actually a very yes. user-friendly device. And I would actually recommend it for especially large vessels with deep calcification. The other aspect, eccentric lesions are always very difficult to treat uh, mm -hmm. with any device, as you know. And with the uh, uh, and I'm a great proponent of ultra high pressures, but the disadvantage and eccentric lesions with ultra high pressures that you just going to blow up on the normal side. Uh, and especially on an angulated segment, perhaps create perforations if you're trying to just try and move the eccentric lesion away and you're really affecting the normal side and expansion towards the normal side. If you deliver enough pulses in an eccentric lesion uh, and the eccentric lesions need more pulses, you actually do get an expansion which is far more uniform with IVL followed by stent implantation rather than uh, ultra high pressure followed by stent implantation and eccentric lesions. Uh, those are my comments. And thanks, thanks, Arshul. Uh, looks like there's a lot of interest in this topic. Uh, <laughs> can I just ask some of the questions uh, pulled yes, in? Uh, before, before Jack, I would like uh, Ra Rashid to comment because he's actually uh, on the panel there, Khalid al -Faridi. I would like Khalid to comment uh, before we go on to your, your comment. So Khalid, please. yourself, please. Yes, thank you, Mr. Ashok. Thank you, Professor Lee, for this interesting uh, talk. I'll just emphasize that what you said from the last, which is the importance of imaging. If you're going to use these devices or you're going to use rotablator or you're going to manage heavy calcific, I think the role of imaging, either IVAS or OCT, is very crucial here uh, if you wanted to use it. Majority of this lesion we can ma manage with the only high pressure balloon or cutting balloon, but if you're going to go advanced, uh, to root ablator or uh, shockwave, I think uh, complementary imaging is very crucial for that uh, to use. Yes. We don't have here in my cath lab the super high pressure balloon. I'm very interested to try it or to see more about it. But we have the root ablator. The majority of the cases recently we use the IVL. We have very successful results, especially in stentary stenosis or patients who have underexpanded stent and behind it calcium where. It worked very well to expand, to crack the calcium behind the, the stent. Uh, it was very useful. Uh, my question to you, Professor Lee, uh, I have two questions, quick question. Would you routinely, we know that we inflate to four, then we leave the shock, then up to six, then we deflate. Would you routinely do both there with high pressure balloon after that before stenting or you don't? That's my first question. Um, we usually, um, depends on the, uh, the size, the lumen of the vessel. If we think we can cross uh, with the shortwave balloon, then we would actually pr primarily do a shortwave balloon. And if we see good result with expansion of the shortwave balloon, we can go ahead and do stenting right away. But if we, you, you know, um, it's not uh, uh, really the very uh, good uh, semi-compliant balloon to use. Sometimes it's difficult to cross, then we might use a smaller balloon, smaller NC balloon to first of all, create a lumen for us to use the uh, shockwave yeah. balloon. So, so uh, you know, we have questions here from Hong Kong, Philippines, Australia, Malaysia, India. <laughs> uh, so I think that we should address some of those questions which relate to, so can I bring those questions in? Uh, so first one, uh, and, and be brief, uh, this is to both, uh, while all of us have, good expertise and experience around this, but I'd rather Dr. Cassisi and, and Michael Lee answer these questions. Uh, and of course, do anybody can come in if they've got an added brief comment to it. Well, the first one is, do you recommend using IVL for osteal left main lesions or would you prefer rota for the same? Uh, so that would be for uh, Michael. I would prefer uh, uh, IVL balloon. Correct. Uh, uh, my, this was my question, actually, my second question to Dr. Okay. <laughs> so you got that answer. <laughs> it, it's, it's actually easier to use and uh, 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 less complication will be uh, foreseen. But you have to leave the balloon for 10 seconds if patient have severe LV dysfunction might not tolerate, is it not? Yes, that's right. That's right. But uh, the, the cracking is actually very, very soon. Yeah. The, the second and the third pulse, you will see the cracking. Of the Correct. And, and you can be cumulative about the pulses. So you don't have to deliver the 10 
all at the same time. You can deliver five even, and you can deliver to 10. But 10 is fairly, 10 seconds everybody tolerates. Uh, so now, is it uh, safe to use IVL after balloon dissection? So that was another question. Is it safe to use IVL after balloon dissection? We, Absolutely, I'd say. Uh, uh, yes. There is yes, no... I, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we, we try to expand the lumen if, if, Correct. if we think the IVL cannot pass, so it's safe to use. So, so a two millimeter balloon is what you use to create enough space for the IVL to... Yes, that's right. IVL two or two five, pass. yeah. So, and then those uncrossable lesions do, do a rotational atherectomy first uh, with a 1.25 or a 1.5 fiber, which will get you enough to cross an IVL yes. and then yes, use the IVL. Right. What about the patients uh, where there is no OCT evidence of calcium fracture after IVL? Is it a failure? Uh, so... Um, Sometimes we need to repeat the procedure to, to create that fracture. It takes time, it takes pauses, it takes energy, especially for very, very deep heart calcium. Heart. Deep right. heart and eccentric calcification. And by the way, calcium nodule may not respond to IVL. That's right. That's right. Uh, so Dr. Said, can I make a comment here? Oh, yes, Praveen. Do, do. Yeah. You're, you're a great expert at it. Please mm. go ahead. No, no, you are. I, 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 I saw a very interesting case shown by Dr. Kasisi. Yeah. Where the after the IVL we had to go for a open NC balloon. In fact, I have a couple of patients where we did, uh, you know, we finished all the pulses with the IVL balloon, and it was not responding. And then finally, we went with the open NC, go to very high pressures, and then we could crack it. So maybe it just loosens it a little bit, and then. Uh, we can do it later on with that uh, because it just still needs some pressure. Oh, you're so right, Praveen. And so the more is... the eccentric lesion, I think I, IVL first and OPN followed. Yeah. And I have a, a number of cases uh, like that. So I think I always believe these are complementary rather than competitive, even though Dr. Cassisi is going to do a great study as a comparison. Mm -hmm. uh, but in, many, in some cases, which are very complex, these are complementary rather than competitive. Thank, thank you for that comment, Raprabhi. Uh, and have you used shockwave therapy for unprotected left main artery lesions? I think uh, the answer yes, to that is, is yes, of course. How do you choose? Uh, how do you choose? Uh, and I'll ask Dr. Kasisi this. How do you choose the patient for device uh, in that we've got more tools for calcified lesions? Any algorithm? While, while Michael's uh, shown an algorithm, uh, uh, Dr. Kasisi, Salvatore, yourself, uh, what is the sort of algorithm? And now, be, I think I'd like you to be balanced between the use of rotational atherectomy uh, or, or atherectomy, uh, ultra high pressure, and IVL. I completely agree. I, I thank also Professor Lee for his very great presentation because I think that, uh, and you for organizing this very uh, thoughtful um, discussion. You know, uh, uh, in the daily practice, uh, the crossability of the lesion is the important thing that can switch to one device or another. But first of all, I would like to say to you, there is the possibility, and it should be also the possibility to understand through the imaging, which device is uh, 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 the patient will profit the most. Because if you can see eccentric, nodules, eccentric, you can switch to one device or another, depending the crossability of the lesion. Because I think that sometimes we face also some lesions we are not possible with the uh, microcatheter, and then you go through with the uh, rotablator. So I think that all these devices, the super high pressure balloon, the IVL device, they are paying some things in terms of crossability. So the crossing the lesion is the first part. You can also achieve the crossability of one of these two devices with a non component balloon, a little bit uh, with a small diameter, but I think that. Uh, the crossability is the turning point of our procedure. And regarding the combination of this device, I completely agree that this device can be competitive if they will competitive or will uh, one or inferior to another uh, with a randomized trial that they will can demonstrate this. For sure, also in Germany, the costs are an issue because uh, for extensive uh, lithoplasty of a vessel, you need to two device and maybe it should be it, it would be a problem from a, a cost perspective a perspective but for sure i think that imaging is key point crossability is the second point 
And then at the end, the final imaging control is another key point because with, I don't know if Professor Lee makes some post dilation with IVL, but with OPN, we make a lot of post dilation. So it is something uh, on a balance between the two devices. I think that is something that is more pros a OPN balloon than IBM. For the lesion preparation, we have to understand which is competitive, which is uh, you can use concomitant. For lesion post dilation, maybe at the moment, but I don't know, in the experience of Professor Lee for vessel post dilation, maybe I think that IBM is a little bit less uh, uh, um, useful than the OPN. So, so now finally, uh, I'm going to, and I know that we are uh, over time, but that's not the issue. We want a good discussion and we want to convey the discussion rather than the talk. So, so we don't mind even going 15 minutes over time on the whole, whole, uh, whole symposium and the webcast. Because so at the end of the day, it's for... something. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, and before, as Praveen, before you go ahead, can I just present a final question from the audience and then I'll have your question, uh, your, your comment? Uh, so... The question, which are two or three have asked, is the same, which is
X, which is my most difficult educational calcified lesions. I'm going to firstly introduce Ramesh Dagobati and, uh, and then hand it over to both Jack as well as Ramesh. Jack from Singapore, you all very well know, but Ramesh is, uh, is a, a very leading thought, a, a thought leader in interventional cardiology based in the United States in New York itself is uh, on uh, key, uh, key positions, key leadership positions in SCI and many of the intervention societies of uh, America and United States. He's been very integral part of, uh, of uh, teaching, education, and other activities in the United States and for Asia Pacific region, and certainly for India. He's uh, an expert in all devices and has really been a true friend uh, for last many years. Uh, with that, Ramesh, I hand it over to you. And Jack, uh, who's integral part of APSIC, as well as the president of the Asia Pacific Society of Cardiology. So over to you, Ramesh. Thank you very much, Ashok. I really appreciate uh, uh, this uh, opportunity to participate in uh, APSIC and the difficult calcified lesions from the United States. I uh, bring in uh, all uh, wishes and uh, to be safe for each and every pa pa participant as well as the uh, uh, speakers. So I think uh, we're going to go ahead and start. I just wanted to introduce Jack. Uh, you want to say a few words? Um, no, I'm, I'm good. Actually, uh, I was just coming to also narrate the questions. I realized there were so many wonderful questions from participants. And uh, I think the questions maybe you can address in your case also is how to fit the algorithm in the applied case and to address some of the concerns uh, for the audience as well that was uh, well narrated uh, by Ashok. So uh, maybe you can start. Thank you very much, Jack. I think uh, Ashok has asked me to also show one case. I think uh, we have a, a, actually the second session is my most difficult and educational calcified cases of uh, three, but probably you'll get one bonus as well from me. So I'll go ahead and uh, show you this uh, right away. Uh, so without uh, wasting too much time, I think you can see my screen now. So can you see my screen? Uh, yes, we can, uh, please go ahead. Okay, sounds good. So these are my disclosures. So here is an 86 year old gentleman with severe aortic stenosis, uh, coronary artery disease, PCI, and uh, with the paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, a mean gradient of 56, ejection fraction 60, mild MR and AI. And he had come in with the class three uh, symptoms of uh, dyspnea and exertion. Uh, uh, due to his age and uh, comorbidities, he was felt to be a TAVR patient. And uh, so we uh, looked at the echocardiogram here. You can see heavily calcified uh, aortic valve. And uh, so there's um, some mild AI and MR, but uh, you know, heavy calcified valve with mean gradients here, as you can see about uh, 55 uh, uh, millimeters of mercury. And uh, so this is uh, no doubt it's a severe AS. And uh, so this is how we have done with the TAVR. And you can see a 34 millimeter TAVR was placed and I'll show you those other slides, but uh, with uh, some paravalor leak, which we again ballooned that and uh, uh, with the 24 balloon, Atlas balloon and uh, got an excellent result. But uh, that was not the story for this patient. How did we get access? I think is the most you know, important one here for this uh, gentleman. The limitation was uh, uh, small uh, uh, internal external iliac arteries. And you can see in the common iliac artery as, uh, as well on the left side is very small and uh, uh, very prohibitive on the left side. On the right side, we thought, okay, this is 4.9 by 5.3 or, uh, you know, what we'd like to have is 6 or 5.5. So we said, okay, maybe the dilators will work. And uh, so we first uh, got access on bilateral femoral and uh, we did a, a distal iotic, uh, iotogram with runoffs. And you can see here in the common iliac on the left side is very heavily calcified. And on the, the right side, there is some minimal lesion and but the external iliac arteries are where here you can see calcification. And uh, so uh, we said, okay, let's try uh, the Coombs dilator, serial dilation and dilators. And uh, so the uh, 10 French dilator went easily. And after that, we hit the roadblock and it wouldn't pass. Okay. So uh, only up to 10 French we could go up. And so then we
uh, what is the uh, therapies in our uh, usual algorithm for us is try dilator. If the dilators do not work, uh, don't push too much because you can actually cause more uh, damage to the peripheral, artery, uh, peripheral arteries. So then we go ahead with a shockwave 7060 uh, balloon and uh, multiple pulses were delivered uh, up and down neck, actually even up to the almost the distal iota and all the way to the external iliac artery. And uh, we have a small sheet here through which we went for a run through and, uh, uh, and the balloon and delivered multiple pulses. And uh, so as you can see, once actually you go up to four atmospheres, as Michael Lee uh, mentioned, you go and deliver the uh, uh, pulses, but then actually you can expand as a regular balloon, you can go up to eight, 10 uh, atmospheres and it doesn't rupture. So, uh, so, but don't deliver at the eight or 10, you should deliver only at four atmospheres of pressure and then you can use it as a regular balloon as well. So then actually an 18 French dilator and the sheet was very easy to pass. And the rest of the story actually, as I showed you, is very simple and easy to perform once you get uh, uh, the sheet uh, crossing the aortic valve with the uh, Lundequist, uh, with the AL1 and uh, straight wire to exchange for Lundequist. And uh, we delivered that uh, 34 millimeter valve without any problem. So here's the completion angiogram, it looks okay. Uh, we delivered a manta uh, here, there is some slow flow for that. Uh, but so we did a peripheral vascular uh, uh, ultrasound so that the right CFA, yeah, as you can see, here is the manta. So it appears that it is closing some, that's the food process inside. And, uh, but there's still some flow across the peripheral artery uh, uh, across the CFA. So, so it is a, this is a successful way of doing uh, still transfemoral, obviously alternate access could be done uh, as subclavian or carotids, but I think it is still transfemoral has been shown to be superior to other alternate access. Uh, so here I just wanted to show you uh, one case and then we'll move on to the, uh, and, uh, the presentation by Ashok said. So it's my now great uh, pleasure to introduce uh, to, to the master of uh, interventional cardiology uh, Ashok Seth doesn't need an introduction, is the president of APSEC and has uh, been uh, in multiple uh, leadership roles, including a board member at uh, Sky uh, as well. Uh, so I think I welcome Ashok and uh, please proceed with your presentation. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Ramesh. Uh, that was a fantastic case, uh, short and sweet. Uh, Wichim, do you have any comments? Uh, no comments. So I'm just going to leave Ashok Seth to go on. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so maybe uh, if there's no other comments from the panel, we'll have Ashok present his case. I think uh, Ashok is having some issues with his Wi-Fi. Uh, can I just uh, pick the brain of Ramesh and Michael? Uh, the lithotripsy technology they are pitching to apply in the aortic valve as well. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think uh, that'll be a great uh, thing if you can actually make a large balloon and uh, as a size of uh, 20 or 25 and uh, uh, up to um, 26 millimeter balloon and uh, deliver at four atmospheres, the risk of uh, uh, a severe AI probably will be less. Uh, now, sometimes annular rupture has happened to me as well. Uh, when I went with the 26 uh, uh, true, uh, true dilatation balloon, uh, I did uh, have a, a aortic annular rupture. So those risks of uh, rupture will be removed when you go to only four atmospheres so you don't have to really compress, a, I mean, dilate the uh, aortic valve that much. I think uh, that'll be uh, great. Uh, can I ask a quick question? I think it's a, it's a great concept as I mentioned in my last uh, sentence in the conclusion slide. Uh, I, I think uh, we heard uh, uh, some presentation from uh, Darren Milot about two years ago in the EuroPCR about this uh, shortwave balloon for the aortic valve to treat aortic stenosis. But uh, I, I don't know, maybe there are trials running, uh, going on. Uh, it, it doesn't really materialize uh, so far. Uh, there, it's a good concept. I know there are a lot of hurdles to uh, get through, but... the shockwave for any femoral axis issues. So in every patient, 
patient who has a calcified lesion in the common iliac or the iliac or maybe even the aorta sometimes there is a huge calcific chunk so you have used in all of these situations and is there any patient where you will say okay this is not a good one to be done by ivl and just go for another alternate axis so our cut off is actually uh, less than uh, 4.5 we have not used it but above 4.5 mm if the dilators go we always try with the dilator if the dilators uh, go there's no problem if not we go for ivl and the reason is uh, also because it's cost it's expensive uh, and it does uh, add another uh, $3000 uh, expenditure to our uh, uh, procedure as well so that's why and uh, you know if it is less than 4.5 no doubt we don't even try any attempt we just go for alternate axis thanks that's a great pointer so i think asho is still trying to get back in if we can move on to tegu's presentation first before asho tegu will you be ready to present tegu you are muted uh Tegu, would you like to unmute yourself? We can't uh, really hear you. Uh, you have to unmute yourself first, Tegu. Yeah, Dr. Set is back if you want.
uh, the lesion is osseal in locations. It is a very tight lesion. And also there is a, a, a severe angulations here in the proximal right corner artery. And I don't think that uh, we can also advance an uh, IVL balloon because of the uh, big profile of the balloon. Because uh, with, even with one millimeter balloon, we could not advance this uh, one millimeter balloon. So uh, we uh, decided to use ROTA. And this is uh, the uh, uh, Amplus catheter, which uh, provide a good backup. Of course, uh, it is very important to stress here that coaxiality is uh, where uh, has to be. It's not intubated, and we have to advance the bird very slow with slow pecking motion. And here, I use half a rotational anthrectomy up until this point only. And then we use uh, balloon dilatation, stepwise balloon dilatation from smaller and to bigger, uh, slightly bigger bird, a uh, bigger balloon. But uh, we use only until a 1.5 millimeter balloon. And then after that, after that, we can advance even bigger bird, 1.5 and 1.70 millimeter bird. Unfortunately, we don't have two millimeter bird even though we do believe that with uh, this big vessel, we need bigger bird, but we don't have uh, that on the shelf. So this is the final result. Of course, there is still some irregularities. Uh, if I do have a, a OPN balloon or a IVL, I would, I would definitely try uh, both, uh, any of this, uh, any of this uh, device, but uh, unfortunately we don't have. So this is the maximal, uh, maximum uh, result that we can get, but uh, we are satisfied considering uh, the difficulty of the uh, clinical scenario. So at that time, we use speaker bore, which could pass the lesions. So uh, this is the first case. And this is the second case. This is a 91-year-old uh, lady presented with acute coronary syndrome. And the patient has uh, left main, severe left main stenosis, and severe double vessel disease, and on top of that, severe aortic stenosis. I think you will agree with me, the patient has uh, massive calcifications here. Uh, uh, this is a uh, matter annular calcifications, and the uh, left main is, uh, has 90% uh, stenosis here. With calcific, uh, cal, uh, calcific nodule. The LED is heavily angulated here. This is the lamin with aneurysm in the osseum. And then there is a 90% stenosis in the proximal segment of the uh, LED. And there is a CTO here in the uh, circumflex, but the circ is the uh, smallest and non dominant. And the right coronary artery is shown here. There's two patent, uh, uh, patent stands here in the proximal segment. Create two collaterals to the LCX, but not to the LED. So what to do? See here, very uh, critical narrowing. And this is uh, from different angles, spider. You see here, very narrow, uh, very critical narrowing here in the uh, body of the left main. And aneurysm formation here. And the angle of takeoff is very acute. You see here, the angle is very difficult to, to negotiate. I even could not advance my wire across this angle. So, of course, if I try and fail, the patient may die on the table. You see here that the STS score is indeed very high for mortality and also for morbidity. Euroscore 2 is also very high for mortality. And in fact, the family as well as the patients decline surgery considering her age. So PCI first or AFI first, but both are at very high risk. So uh, since the patients and the family decline surgery, so we decided to do PCI, uh, telling also the family that the risk is also very high. So we use the smallest balloon, one point millimeter balloon, but this could not uh, cross the lesions. So we use tornos and also could not cross the lesions. So uh, we applied halfway rotational arthrectomy. Unfortunately, I cannot advance the wire to the LED 
which is very angulated, and also there is an aneurysm uh, here in the right in the ostium of the uh, LAD. So we do uh, the wire is uh, placed in the T1, and then uh, great care was taken so that the bird drilling was only in the left main, as shown here also. I don't want to perforate the vessel. So after this, the, the procedure is made easy. This is 1.5 millimeter balloon, followed by a bigger balloon, and then uh, stenting of uh, the LEC, uh, proximal LED lesions with the stions, and also stenting uh, the, the, di uh, the distal uh, uh, LED and uh, distal left main to the LED, and then stenting. of the left main up to the osseum and then uh, what to flare the osseum. And this is the result, the final result. I think very much acceptable. Here, yeah, this is the LED and this is the LED. And you you may remember that the distal cirque was fed by a blood cross from the right, but not the LED. So this is the final results. And then patient underwent uh, well, stage uh, um, yeah, this is a stage procedure. So uh, this is a, a series of cases uh, reported by uh, Dr. Sakakura also from Japan because he has uh, uh, the 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 only person who has the uh, most cases. This is a case report that just uh, last year. Uh, I just want to draw your attention to the uh, light green row here that successful balloon dilatation following halfway rotational atherectomy is 90%.95. Not 90.5%. This is uh, quite acceptable considering that the lesion is uh, very challenging. And again here, reason for halfway rotational arthrectomy in its uh, series, uh, mainly because of ang angle within the lesion in 62% of his uh, patient populations. Uh, other reasons includes also included also diffuse long lesions and uh, resistance uh, uh, within the lesions in 8% and course, halfway uh, due to ST, uh, severe acid elevation. And this is uh, complications of these procedures. Uh, this is a match comparison with uh, conventional rotational atherectomy. Again, I just want to draw your attention to the, this uh, light green uh, row. Slow flow after rotational atherectomy is uh, more or less similar to that of uh, conventional uh, atherectomy. Procedural myocardial infarction, periprocedural myocardial infarction is also similar. But again, here, uh, uh, this is uh, also very important. Burr entrapment and perforations, two important uh, complications that we are afraid of. Afraid most is 0% uh, reported and 0% in his uh, uh, 60, uh, 56 uh, cases. So, in conclusion, the goal of a rotational atherectomy in calcified lesion is for plaque modifications to facilitate uh, stent implantations and to achieve good results without severe complications. Rotablations in angulated, heavily calcified lesions tends to cause complications of especially perforations and poor entrapment. Halfway rotational atherectomy is an alternative method to use in this uh, situation. Uh, thank you so much. I hope I have spoken a few reasons. Thanks. Uh, you are still jumping out of the plane all the time. I can see based on your cases, fantastic cases and presentation, Tegu. So there's a question yeah. from the audience. I would just like to quickly address this question by our panel before I move on to Ashok's uh, final presentation. So the question is for such cases, uh, the question from Dr. Navin India is, OAS better in angulated calcified lesion, so maybe I can get uh, uh, Chim and Dr. Gaku. And I would also, yeah, that's right. I hope we, we, Praveen is there and, and yeah. Gaku and Absalur Rahman. Yeah, so I, 
Bashir Hanif, by the way, he just messaged yeah. because he had a uh, the floods. Diameter of the bird oh. is uh, almost the same. Hey, that's of, uh, 1.5, 1.25, 1.75, or 1.75 millimeters. Correct. Per, but, per but, but, per. but doing a halfway actually makes you makes the bird go down the curve far better in the oh, 1.5, yeah, yeah. in the 1.5 instead of yeah, the 1.25, because. because it provides a space for it to actually go down. And those are one of the diagrams of uh, this is Sakamura has done that beautiful testing around that and showed that it going around the curve. If you've done it with a 1.5, you actually have it going down much better than a 1.25. One more question from uh, Malaysia. Joseph Garwell is asking, Tegu, would you now uh, uh, choose uh, IVL instead of a uh, half a rotation atherectomy in these angulated patients or lesions? Yeah, at that time we don't have uh, IVL. Of course, uh, IVL is a good option, but for very critical, uh, uh, very uh, critical narrowing in the osseum, this is a good uh, indication, of course, uh, for IVL. But if that the IVL is very bulky, so yeah. uh, even one point feet, uh, one point zero millimeter per uh, millimeter balloon cannot be advanced across uh, the osseum of the right coronal artery. So I don't think that we can use IVL for the uh, to treat the osseum. But yeah. after uh, we pass the angle, I think we need IVL because the lesion is still heavily calcified. But we don't have bigger burr. We, at that time, we don't have uh, IVL and or OPN. So probably we need the... Uh, yeah, absolutely. There is a role for every device. I don't There's think... There's a role uh, for There's a complementary. Complementary. And Bashir, can anything can in the ask comments? Can Dr. Kanto's question, please? If... Yes, I think Dr. Faraidi. The second case, uh, when you did the rotoblator, your wire is not very distal; it's just very minimal. Yeah. Is that I was not advanced. Oh, you? This is not. This is a tricky situation, and this is not a safe procedure because actually we need to advance uh, further deeper in. But I cannot advance uh, considering the you know the yeah. almost uh, Z-shaped uh, angle even to the diagonal. So I, I, I advanced the bird very, very carefully, very slowly with the slow pecking motion, creating to create, right. uh, to, to just to break the calcium. And then, uh, and blue. Sure. Dr. Tegu, I have a comment on your uh, left main case. This was a phenomenal case. I must say that I would not have actually went ahead and do the, do this when, but the interesting thing was that as he was mentioning about the wire positioning, you actually positioned the wire in the diagonal, I think, and uh, that was a straighter path for the, or maybe it was a remus, I don't uh, know, but it went straight in. It was a very short, so I will call it as a half way wire and a half way rota. That is yeah. how it was. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But very, very nice case. Congratulations. Very nice. Right? Definitely you. not for the beginners in the uh, rotational or atherectomy uh, arena. Uh, shall we move on to the next presentation? Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead, I think, uh, with my presentation. And uh, let me just come up with the slides. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you, Tego. That was great. And I think, uh, yeah, we will. <clears throat> Can you see my slides? Shetty from Bangalore is uh, any, has anyone done IVL in uh, carotid? Michael, are you still online? Michael is still online. Yeah. 
I um, haven't heard of uh, uh, any cases being done in the carotids, but, but I, I don't know if the carotids are usually very calcified. But yeah. uh, theoretically, you can you can do it just provided uh, it you use the peripheral sort of um, IVL balloon. Right. But I have not done it before. Yeah, me neither. Oh. <laughs> Share. It's, uh, it's off label, by the way, right? Yes. Yes. I'm so sharing screen. Don't 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 okay. try it. Oh, so you have not shared uh, your screen as yet. Yeah. Now I've shared my screen. Have I? Yeah. Yes. We are seeing it now. There you go. It has come. Yeah. Good. Okay. So now now you see the sharing screen. Okay. Right. So <clears throat> what are you going to talk about? Is I think a spectrum of cases. Just pointing out many of the things which have been discussed and and truly. Uh, representative of some of the aspects uh, which have been questioned also. So let's just take you to, you know, in 2011, we've actually explained a number of times that do not implant a stent until the lesion is completely dilated in a calcified lesion. I think that perhaps should be the number one message that I'd like to give to the audience. And we've done that repeatedly. And yet even till date, we ourselves occasionally by mistake believe that a lesion is pliable and will dilate well and implant stents, finding that we've got an under-expanded stent or a situation where regularly is referred to as under-dilated stents, having been put in a heavily calcified lesion without adequate pre-dilatation. Now, earlier on, when it was 2011, our only, ask, only treatment for these lesions used to be stent ablations. Say like this, two point, this, this patient who had a under-expanded stent in a heavily calcified vessel, restenosis in six months' time. This is a patient with previous bypass surgery, comes and then we on tries non-compliant balloons up to 24 atmospheres, burst a couple of balloons, still the lesion doesn't open. And at that stage, the only thing we, could, we did have was move on to rotational atherectomy, do a stent ablation with a 1.25 bar. In this case, even then it would not open at 26 atmosphere and then ablate with a 1.5 millimeter bar. And uh, then finally the lesion gives way. Well, like it or not, this continues to happen even in the present time that you keep seeing these lesions. And therefore let's take you through what is the, the so, so clearly we need to understand that even these happen. When we're talking about February of 2018, where there's a high grade stenosis, looks innocuous, but I'm sure has a napkin ring calcification because the operator sees a balloon not being dilated. And despite this, a stent gets implanted into this vessel, firstly moves distally, and halfway is a proximally, proximal part of the stent is into the lesion or partially into the lesion. But then having realized that it's been missed, another stent goes in and this misses the lesion also and goes proximally. And then we still have a lesion in between. So a third stent goes in, now covering the under dilated lesion. And that's the operator still tries to dilate that lesion while having implanted a stent into it. And then this is the residual stenosis as anyway, as expected. The patient also has a circumflesion circumflex lesion, which is not attempted because this residual stenosis with three stents is not a great big deal. You can also see the vessel is small. It, it looks small. It's uh, certainly not been treated well, but of course, this is the circumflex stenosis. Now it comes back in December, 2018. This is where we have the advantages now. So for all under dilated lesions, we have two options now. So this is the Ivers catheter, which doesn't go in after a bit of taking away the restenotic fibrous tissue part of it, one is able to then image this and it's clearly a circumferential cal calcification with marked under, under <coughs> dilatation and under stenting of the vessel with small, the luminal areas inadequate compared to the vessel size of four, 3.5 and 3.75. So of course, we talked about the ultra high pressure balloon, but here's the advantages we now have. We could either use intravascular lithotripsy in such situations or the ultra high pressure balloons, which also gives us the advantage, not just to go to the high pressures. And here's a 3.5 millimeter vessel. Somebody asked, 
would you take a 3.5? No, I would not. I'd take a three, go up to 45 atmospheres and the lesion gives way. And that's what I would do when I'm using an ultra high pressure balloon. Uh, so that's the second point I wanted to make. And then by the way, even an ultra high pressure balloon does grow. It grows less than the non-compliant balloons. So at, at 45 atmospheres, a three millimeter balloon would get close to a 3.4. The only issue is that a 3.4 would be achieved by a three millimeter non-compliant balloon at 24 to 25 atmospheres. And then of course, this is four millimeter test implanted to high pressures. Now look at the vessel, it's huge. And that is, now you get large areas. And that is why I, we believe that many calcified vessels are under dilated if they're not imaged appropriately. So it's not just that. And again, I'm not passing it on to the experts. It's for many people in the audience that we can continue to. But the other message in this patient is that the circumflex lesion is bound to be similarly bad because a patient has one heavily calcified lesion. He has multiple heavily calcified lesion. And that's another message that one needs to understand. And therefore it gets very important to image that. And as we image the circumflex lesion, you can see though it's calcified, again, it's a napkin ring calcification. So in this, what would be my options? This is the option prior to, to IVL. This is, remember, 2018, we introduced IVL. I, <coughs> I introduced IVL into India in uh, January of 2020. So here it is, napkin ring. Okay, a 1.5 bar. Would that be adequate? Look at that again with a non-compliant balloon. We actually have a, have a waist. So I decide to take in, of course, a 1.75 bar. We have the option of two millimeter bar, OP and ultra high pressure balloon and IVL is what I would do at the moment an IVL. At this case, it was 1.75 followed by an opian. the same three millimeter opian. This is a 3.5 millimeter vessel. Look at the opian bursting at 40 atmospheres. But the advantage of opian bursting is the fact that it bursts in most instances like this rather than a jet. It actually traverses, it, it tears rather than gives a jet. And therefore it does cause a dissection, but it doesn't cause a perforation at 40 atmospheres. And then of course, it's a 3.5 millimeter stent implanted again at uh, moderate pressures and you had a good result. So again, again, a combination of technologies is what gives you adequate MSCs in a concentric heavily calcified vessel, which is resistant. So combination technologies, importance of vessel sizing to avoid complications, and perhaps the deep and thick calcification are best treated by IVL. Coming to rotational arthrectomy, I mean, this is an 84-year-old, unstable angina, marked ST segment changes on IABP, angiogram done at another center, referred to us. He's got chronic kidney disease and, and obstructive avis disease. Just look at, uh, so of course, his ejection fraction is 30%. Uh, ACS, but he's got his last remaining vessel. And I think I wanted to see that. That's heavily calcified, tortuous uh, vessel, RC is occluded. And, and these are tortuosities on two planes, as you can actually see. This was obviously with the hemodynamic support, but the 1.5 per after seven minutes of burring time, doesn't move from this place. I managed to get the rotor wire down, but uh, the burr will not grow. Possibilities, this is why I want to transfer these possibilities. This is not even a halfway rotational arthritis. This is, this is nowhere rotational arthritis. It is not even going to go through those. When we have a 1.25, this is not where I would upgrade to a 1.5. I don't believe a 1.5 would burr, by the way. The reason 1.5 can work in many instances of a 1.25 not working is because the burring area is larger. And therefore, if you actually create a space, you'd actually be able to get a larger burring area. But penetration force is going to be higher with this oblong P-shaped burr, except that the greater issue of entrapment. And by the way, in this case, the burr did get entrapped, but I was able to yank it back. Now, this is after seven millimeters of burring time. There is no balloon which would cross it, none whatsoever. Number of 0.8 and one millimeter balloons and none of them would cross it. None of them would even peck inside to actually cross it. 
So I'm faced with a situation which is practically unfathomable even after one and a half to two hours. And of course, then the better way to do it is take these small balloons and keep on bursting them inside the lesion. Implosions, as we call them. And CT operators do this fairly regularly for, for heavily calcified vessels. And I think I burst six or seven balloons in this lesion to get me enough space for the rotablator burr to advance. So upsize, downsize, we just discussed the upsize issue, by the way, there are two things you can do, actually do. If a, a 1.5 millimeter burr doesn't cross, then you actually move to a 1.25 millimeter burr. If that doesn't cross, move from a floppy, rotor floppy to a rotor support. And if that doesn't cross, move up on the rotor support to a 1.5 burr. That's the algorithm for uncrossable rotablator, uh, rotor, rotational atherectomy, uncrossable lesions. So implosion is one of the things laser, front end laser could have been, which I don't have, uh, but it is again a 10 minute of burring time on the 1.25. And finally that 1.25 millimeter cross. In our present time, after this crossing, I would definitely go on to a 1.75, but I to follow up with an IVL in such heavy calcification. But that's the burr crossing, then it was followed by a 1.75 and, and, and you can, see that the 1.75 and it's actually remember it's in two planes that they're seeing and then sorry uh, gosh let me just go back and of course we had that uh, finally stented and uh, and that was the result I lost that branch do you see that that created a lot of problems and I had to get that branch back the first big branch as you can actually see I was able to get that branch back but this patient actually really for the next two days was 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 terrible it took him enough time because I had, by the way, stunned his myocardium, projection fraction dropped from 30 to 20. Prolonged ischemic time is what happens when we deal this. Briefly, again, halfway burring comes up here. Osteoproximal LAD and a circumflex which is heavily calcified. I'm not going to dwell on the circumflex because that's just rotational atherectomy followed by a stent, a 1.25 burr followed by a stent. But the LAD is revealing. It's, it's actually... Uh, Osteoproximal spreads right from the ostea. And this is again, uh, sorry, did I lose the track? Uh, uh, I should have got this. Yeah. So the, there are, this I think it's been missed out. Forget this one because the, the, the clear one, the, the messages I had got missed out in this. Let me just go to my last one. Ah, right here, is the, sorry, the message is right here. So the 1.25 burr cannot cross it. Again, it's because of angulation in that, and this is a two minute burring time. A balloon dilatation helps for that burr to cross, but then again, it doesn't cross for another three minutes at the distal point. Angulated segment at that particular point, it doesn't cross it halfway. So what again, what do we do? We take uh, a non-compliant balloon out there and that bursts at 26 atmospheres. So this again becomes a case for an IVL, a shockwave balloon with a, gu with a guide liner being thrust across that tightest point. It only goes halfway across the tightest point, but then deliver shockwave. That's the first part is it totally delivers halfway, then you create more space and then deliver 80 pulses all the way up to the ostea. And then uh, OCT guided, you actually do uh, uh, good osteal stenting, uh, covering, of course, first the distal and then the proximal. And then you're actually finished with this, again, at high pressure dilatations. But uh, uh, you have a, a OCT guidance, gives you good positioning at the ostea with really two struts only covering the circumflex with a, with a good optimized result. But uh, finally, the, be the one of the worst cases I'd like you to understand and how to combine things together is this, uh, I think is this case, yeah. So if you just excuse me for this, uh, and this perhaps represents to me the real combination why we call it. So it's shepherd's crook. This has been intervened once. Uh, it, unfortunately, the previous operator could only get somehow a stent in the mid segment, but could not dilate it adequately. It was under dilated and this patient re rapidly, but there was a whole segment of his vessel which hadn't been, which had been, been. 
And I, by the way, when I saw this, I didn't have the previous angiogram. I couldn't know where the stenosis was. This vessel was so calcified, so heavily calcified that I couldn't even know where the, didn't even know where the stent was implanted. But I was told that there were two stents implanted I could figure out. Anyway, I guess one of them would have been in the mid segment where it had restenos because it had, it hadn't been, it had only been partially dilated. It was upward going and it was in a 90 year old. So we had multiple support. We had a long sheath. AL1 guide, Grand Slam wire, guide liner, and a two millimeter balloon would not cross that distal point as you can actually see. So it's, it's a guide liner and a two millimeter balloon would not cross. Even a one, one, one millimeter balloon would not cross. A micro catheter would not cross the distal point. This is as heavy as they get. So of course, decided, of course, the first step is a burr. So that gets you space. With a 1.5 bar, the lesions dilated with a three millimeter non-compliant balloon at high pressures and lesion dilated with 3.5. Now the guideline is still in place because there's a stent which keeps stopping everything from going in, which is under dilated right at the top. And that's how I guessed it. This of course was followed by an OCT, which told me that there was stent in the mid segment. It's was totally under expanded. This vessel was four, four foot close to 4.5 mil, 4 millimeters. I actually then went ahead and post dilated this with OPN balloons, three millimeters in the distal and 3.5 all the way up to where the stent was and a four millimeter in the stent. Oh, sorry, below, before that, I do a guide, uh, yeah, I do an IVL, again, put through the guide liner. Having seen that much of calcification, and by the way, there was circumferential calcification, well seen at the distal point, a 3.5 millimeter IVL is taken and 80 pulses delivered all along with at least 30 pulses were delivered at the mid segment of this lesion. Use one IVL, I could have used two. Followed, this was followed by an OPN, followed by implantation of stents from the distal all along into the mid segment, which had been dilated by an OPN at four millimeters. After this, took the OPN further the earlier dilatations had been done at 20, 25 atmospheres. Now in the stent, it goes up to 35 atmospheres for the distal part, a four millimeter OPN for the mid part, followed by an uh, OCT, which demonstrated or already demonstrated 4.5 was needed for the mid. So a 4.5 OPN at 40 atmospheres for the, for the this mid segment part. To get that lesion, to get that result on this vessel, this is OCT. This part was dilated with a 4.5 at 35 atmospheres. This is the best I could get, but I think I got an adequate result on a very large vessel, which had already had stents, which was under dilated with circumferential calcification. And that's what brings me to the important point that I got adequate lumens all around on OCT, which brings me to the important point that it is clearly, this is the final result I was quite happy with the final result because it was OCT assessed and because I'd done, there was a calcium nodule by the way, which actually remained. So calcium nodules are difficult to treat. Imaging is essential for optimization. And for these worst sort of cases, we now in the present era do need combination modalities. It could be a combination of rotational atherectomy followed by IVL and followed by OP and ultra high pressure balloons to give adequate lumens in these extremely calcified vessels that we keep seeing now in our daily practices. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks, yeah, Ramesh, go ahead. Yeah, no, e excellent presentation. I think uh, Ashok is uh, really, uh, you have shown uh, how to approach each uh, different type of lesions uh, where uh, uh, a regular balloon uh, to OPN to uh, to IVL and also, you know, you have used a rotational atherectomy and, uh, and uh, you know, really ter terrific, uh, uh, complex patients, you know. Uh, Jack, any comments? And uh, is there any comments uh, from either Bashir or... Jalur, yes, yeah. yes uh, I have been some comments. Uh, yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Dr. Raman. The, uh, two questions. One is um, Tagosh, another, is, uh, another case is um, uh, Dr. Osho. That is a fantastic case. Then my imagination is that in the Tagos case is that he rotabulated and putting the bar at the broad portion of the wire. 
the darker portion is the softer. Is there any chance to uh, that is damaged of the oil or entrapment of the oil? And the Ashokshet, you have dilated the LED. That is very tortuous and aneurysm. So wh which is the lesion is absolute contraindication of rotaplex. And how far you will try for that? So this is a fantastic <laughs> case, but you tackle it very nicely. Yeah. Both of the present are very elegant. Every present is very elegant. So, so, so I think, thank you. Thank you. Tegu, uh, I think, firstly, let me just take the, the question around, uh, see, extreme angulations have to be done very gently. And I think Tegu pointed that out halfway. The way we do angulations, but then we get left vein circumflex angulations, which are usually right angle. The advantage of that is that it comes from a large vessel into a smaller vessel and you ease it. You get LED going into the diagonal. You just have to remember the fact that it's going to cut across uh, and, uh, and there's a guide wire bias happening all the time. You have to understand where the biases are happening and where it will actually cut or may, where it may perforate and it may not even go through. You've got to ease it across bends and curves. That's very important. The moment you feel that it's going to go straighter rather than take the curve, and it won't take the curve, by the way, if you actually got the disease process very tight prior to the lesion, because that's when it will come out at an angle. To take a turn, there has to be enough space in the vessel for it to actually bend. Remember what we said just now, the, the oblique angle of a burr is the same for all burrs. But if you actually have a larger space, then a 1.5 can take the, to take the same, same curve as a 1.25 and a 1.5 blade further more. So you just have to ease it down the corners. But any place where you actually feel if it's greater I would say if it's, I mean, we go across even 75, uh, you know, 75 degrees, we go around 90 degrees, but we have to take small burrs, ease it out, ease it, ease it across and make sure that we, we don't have, uh, uh, we will on occasions go through a media, but we shouldn't go through the adventitia. That's the main thing. Uh, stop when you, when you feel it's yeah, unsafe last, uh, maybe and go, last, go with a balloon last, and go last. with a balloon. So you don't have to take a burr through and through the lesion do half ways because the rest can be tackled with a balloon. Uh, okay. can, can I say something, Ashok? I think an outstanding case is, um, no doubt. Uh, you know, the traditional teaching in the past had been that if there's a dissection, then you should avoid uh, rotational atherectomy. And um, I no know no, now we are doing it, even up like halfway atherectomy and balloon burst. And like up to what extent dissection there is, which is going to inhibit you not doing proceeding with the uh, rotational atherectomy? Brief, brief answer, it doesn't bother us. Brief, brief answer is that. Okay, good. Getting the lesion open is more important. Sure. Okay. So, can I ask a question? Uh, yeah, can I make a comment here? So these uh, cases which we saw are really phenomenal cases and uh, very, very difficult. But I must say that this technique which Dr. Sage showed of the, you know, creating explosions inside. That was quite uh, intriguing and very interesting. And uh, certainly it works. And we have seen this that, you know, you do some one or 1.25 balloon dilatations and, you know, sometimes these balloons burst. This used to happen by chance, but now we are doing it because it used to, you know, started working that way that these balloons burst and then they create a passage for the, uh, you know, the rota to go in. And yeah. the other, you know, thing about using a bigger bar, I think, is also a very nice idea, and you know, one, it works quite well. That you can use a bigger bar; it is safer. It takes some time, so you just can't push it in straight away. It'll, it will, it will be nice to just spend some time, have patience, and then gradually it will make a passage inside. So right. thank you very much for this uh, wonderful cases. I learned a thank lot. Thank you. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you for your comments. Yeah, Dr. Khalid, maybe you come back to your question last, uh, after Hui Chim's last case, then we can group the questions later. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ashok. It's very interesting uh, cases that you presented for, especially the big dilemma for us, uncrossable lesion. When you cross the wire and you cannot cross with even smaller balloons, very challenging and you presented eloquently. Other technique, my, I don't know, have you experience with that? One of my colleagues, I haven't tried it. He used turning bike spiral to screw it and go with the uh, with that. I don't know. Have you had any experience with that? Yeah, Taurus is uh, not with turnpike spiral, but Taurus. And uh, the, these sort of uh, angulated heavy calcification, it doesn't, we, I think I tried it in this. It just would not even budge. Yes, that was also tried in this. I didn't show it. 
it was a five hour long case. And that's why I showed what was really relevant, but that wouldn't even get anywhere. It just wouldn't even go even budge half a millimeter into it. Uh, Ashok, can I get you to stop share so that- uh, Oh yes, yes, yes. Some, you're yeah. so right, thank you. Yeah. No thank problem. You. Yeah. Thanks, all great comments and questions. Uh, maybe uh, in the interest of time, we move on to Hui Qing's uh, presentation. Oh, Hui Qing hasn't presented. Yeah, because uh, we move on to Tegu first. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Hui Qing, sorry. We, we, I thought I was the last presenter. <laughs> so I took more time. Okay, go ahead. But this is, this is all. No it's all learning. Right, team, we can't hear you. We can see your slides. Because I'd got disconnected uh, for 10 minutes, I didn't know that it hadn't been presented. So we received sincere apologies to which team. Uh, no problem. So thanks, Jack. I apologize. I may be standing between your dinner and your bedtime, perhaps. So, but I think the talk uh, that I'm going to be does covering will actually complete the uh, pictures for tonight. Having gone through ultra high pressure balloon, rotational arthrectomy, intravascular lithotripsy, I just want to share with you the best and worst of orbital arthrectomy that I come to know about. I think uh, we are all very familiar with rotational arthrectomy. This is a unidirectional front cutting device. Okay, so you can only create a lumen size as big as the burr. And during the burring process, there's actually no blood and micro debris that can flow through the burr. But when you look at uh, orbital arthrectomy, it is quite different. It is a bi-directional uh, cutting device. So you can uh, ablate as you go forward and you can ablate as you come back as well. And it's also because of this orbital rotation that it exerts a centrifugal force that is directed against the vessel wall. So there's also a pulsatile uh, uh, force uh, that is exerted on the vessel wall besides this sandblasting effect of uh, orbital arthrectomy. And this is a one size fit all. So this 1.25 bar can be used to treat vessels from 2.5 to 4 millimeter, and it allows for continuous flow of blood and saline during orbit. So there are three factors that determine how much of a size that you can get from a single orbital Diamondback 360. The number of passes that you do will determine the ultimate size. The speed at which you advance the birth or, or back forward or, or backward, one millimeter gives you much bigger ablation compared to a 10 millimeter per second sort of ablation speed. And the higher the speed of a rotation, 120,000 versus 80,000 gives you a much bigger ablation. So a combination of these three events determines final uh, luminal size of the vessel. And this is where I think uh, orbital arthrectomy is best. Uh, this is a patient with a very large vessel, as you can see on the still picture on the right side. This is a four millimeter vessel. And if you were to do an intravascular ultrasound of this patient with this concentric uh, calcium, and if I magnified it, uh, this is a concentric calcium with a inner luminal diameter of at least two, 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 five, or maybe two, five. There's no way any bird can actually uh, achieve any sort of ablation. Uh, in this sort of lesion. And this is a situation where I feel orbital arthrectomy is at its best. So you can do a uh, back and forth sort of a slow ablation and you can increase the speed from 80,000 to 120,000 slowly. And then eventually you can finish up with the uh, balloon size of your choice and giving a very good results in a very large vessel. But the worst of uh, orbital arthrectomy will be this particular complications that I want to share with you. This is a 63-year-old diabetic and end-stage renal failure on hemodialysis. So you can imagine, imagine this is a calcified arteries that we're dealing with. This patient had a previous bypass surgery 10 years ago with a lima that is being used. And then he had a subsequent PCI to his right coronary artery uh, about uh, a few, uh, just four years ago. And then he was admitted to another hospital for recurrent uh, non stemi So I want to show you the PCI that was done in 2015. So I don't, not sure whether you can see the stent. There was a stent put in the distal RCA. There was a stent that it put in the mid RCA. And so this is a stretch of a stent that was implanted from here to here. So this was the position of the stent that were put in in 2015. Now, four years later, he came in with a chest pain. And this was the disease that was distal to the stent, obviously. Right, so you can see that uh, the distal RCA was severely diseased. 
right here. So the operator decided to use an orbital, which is fine. But uh, as he advanced and then pulled back the orbital arthrectomy, the, uh, the device got stuck. Now you would think that this is like a usual sort of uh, bird, rotational arthrectomy bird that got stuck, but it's actually not quite the same mechanism. But anyhow, this bird is stuck right now. And so now begins the entire four hours procedure of trying to retrieve this bird that is uh, stuck. So uh, usual technique to uh, put in a second wire, try to balloon, create some passage, dislodge this particular bird, not successful. Took a mother and child balloon with a snare inside and tried to pull the bird. Did you see what happened towards the end of this uh, procedure? I want you to take a closer look at this bird as it come back halfway through. What is happening here is that the bird got intertwined with the stand and part of the stand was stripped off from the distal end of it, or leaving the proximal part of the stand that is still endotherialized. So the stand got stuck here. A patient obviously uh, in terrible situations. So, uh, so I think that was the end of the procedure. There was no way the stand, uh, the bird could be retrieved. And so uh, the operator, apparently a surgeon, simply just cut the shaft and leave this entire device in the patient's right coronary artery at the end of it all. So now we have a device that is left in situ. It comes to my hospital. Six weeks later, we found stable angina and end STEMI again. And we, and we discussed uh, with the heart team a long time. If we were to go in and do a surgical retrieval, it will be going through the Lima, which is terribly uh, not uh, particularly appealing to the surgeon. If we do a percutaneous, I don't think we will be accept, uh, any, anywhere near as uh, success as uh, what was already attempted before. So we decided to have a, actually a hybrid approach where the surgeons will go from the right thoracotomy approach access the RCA, somehow dislodge the, uh, the head of the uh, RCA, the burr, from the, the stand that is intertwined, and then the percutaneous uh, and the interventionist will try to stand it out. Uh, unfortunately, the patients uh, refused, so, uh, so we, we couldn't do anything, and uh, we just treat him medically. And seven months later, he came in again with left lung, uh, lower limb, non-healing gangrenous wound. Uh, we took him to a, a lab to do a PTA, but that was unsuccessful too. He went for a lower limb amputation <laughs> and he had a cardiac arrest two days later and passed on. So this is a terrible situation telling me that when you have an instant stenosis, I think orbital arthrectomy is a real contraindication here because you just don't know how much of uh, endothelialization has taken place. So I think the indications for orbital arthrectomy to me, having seen uh, some of the cases that has been presented, when you have a discrete uh, large vessel stenosis, it's perfect. When you have a thick calcium, <coughs> calcium cap that you want to thin out, thin out somehow, modify somehow, orbital arthrectomy is great. Eccentric lesions where you have no good options, orbital arthrectomy becomes an a, a, a alternative. Uh, it's best for superficial calcification and not for D. Certainly, contraindications will be very tight lesion. You can't go through. You need a rotor in the case. If it's too small a vessel, less than 2.5, don't even try uh, orbital. Angulated lesion is not uh, recommended and instant stenosis, in my opinion. So with that, uh, thank you very much. That is. Thanks, Wichim. Uh, fantastic uh, summary. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, very fantastic. Uh, uh, can I maybe ask whether there's any comments or questions from everyone in the panel? Yes. May I ask I questions? Have, I have that also. Yeah. Uh, may I ask questions? Question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, please. Yes, uh, this is a great case. Uh, we learn a lot from you. Uh, I just want to give comment regarding uh, if we have uh, uh, long lesions and we have to pass that lesions uh, with uh, either rota. So from time to time, we can still use rota, but probably it's not very safe for uh, orbital arthrectomy. Uh, in this kind of situation, we can use kite liner. We use a kite liner and pass that uh, standard lesions with the with the kite liner, and then uh, we use rota to fix distal lesion. If you have a lesion in the uh, distal, uh, we want to fix that. Fair enough. Yes. Actually, this lesion looks very tight for orbital, 
So I may not even consider it because orbital, your nose cone needs to go into the lesions first before you can start to ablate laterally. This is unlike a loader blader where it's cutting at the right at the burr tip. So this being such a tight lesions uh, may not be a good lesion uh, for to treat with orbital. I think that was that was very good, uh, uh, Hui Chim. Uh, the perspective on on what when not to use it was was tremendous, and the complications. Gosh, yeah, these are frightening complications, and uh, I still can't believe that it was left in situ uh, and, and, and patient sent home. I hope it wasn't coming out of his groin. Uh, <laughs> no, I think it was cut off and then the, uh, the shaft got the recoil into the body. The, the Correct. So that, I, I'm sure, I'm sure something, yeah. it must have been in the outer somewhere because it would have recoiled yeah. out. But wouldn't have been nice to see it outside coming out from the... From the I have a, a question for Professor Tan. Uh, very excellent presentation, really. Very nice uh, complication you presented. Not to use as... Uh, Professor Ashok mentioned. My question to you now, we know that the indication for rotational as in, or for the orbital is for large vessel where rotational cannot use. Now with uh, with having the IVL, the shockwave IVL, do you think is any rules for going to be expanded in the orbital atherectomy or what do you, do you think the future for orbital atherectomy? Well, actually, even with the availability of shockwave, I feel that if the calcium is really very thick, the short wave may not perform as well as the orbital atrectomy. I think if you can shave off, you can modify, you can thin out the calcium cap, it makes it much easier for you to actually expand it, uh, the stent. The short wave problem is that uh, while it can cause uh, cracking of the uh, calcium cap, which is thick, sometimes you have this rupture that's happening uh, that we are seeing and we talk about. So it occurs in about 10%. We have about four or five cases of balloon rupture simply because it's just too too hard a lesion. And this current iteration of a shockwave balloon is a thin balloon wall. So until the second uh, version to come on with a thicker balloon wall, we're going to be seeing uh, cases of balloon ruptures, which may not give you the full full ablations or full shockwave or little trips that you uh, you expect from this balloon. So. So I think the orbital still has its role. So uh, it all depends on uh, your personal experience and, uh, and judgment. It's all about skill, judgment, and experience, isn't it, in this field of interventional cardiology? Yeah, so uh, about orbital etherectomy, I may add some uh, points that one of the important things is that to cross the wire, it is much easier than the ruta wire because you can use a you know, normal wire. And the other thing is that you can use it in big vessels. Now, the thing is that if you compare it with the IVL, IVL will not be able to work in many fibrocalcific lesions where there is eccentric calcification, where there is a nodule. So in those kind of cases, or, orbital will still be a reasonably good idea to use. And uh, we were actually part of uh, Dr. Sait and myself. We, were, we did the Orbit 1 trial, which was the first in man for orbital etherectomy. And uh, <laughs> fortunately, we do not have that device now in India. Yes, Praveen, <laughs> yes. We were, we, were, we were the first advanced study of our yeah, metal yeah. So it uh, is pretty easy 12 years ago. Yeah, years so ago. many years ago. I think yeah, 40 years ago. Yeah. Uh, so we still actually use the proprietary yeah, Viper, Viper guide wire provided. We don't use coronary wire, but you're right. This wire performs like a coronary wire. It's much easier to manipulate than a rotor wire. Uh, but we will still use the uh, Viper wire suggested. And we will also use a Viper glide, just like a rotor glide that is recommended uh, for a rotational arthrectomy to reduce the, uh, the, uh, the barrel trauma and the thermal injury that comes with it as well. Do you know that uh, questions are still pouring in? <laughs> I have a list of, uh, <laughs> list of, but we have really, I mean, it's been up. Uh, can you believe that uh, we are been here for close to two hours? Yeah, uh, no, more, no, it's than, more that. than that. Two and a half. So, Professor hours. Tan, going to come to two hours twenty minutes. So, I think. Oh, that... oh sorry. Yeah, oh, no, that's okay. It's oh yeah. This is Gaku. Uh, so, I have a, one question. So, since uh, IVL is not approved in Japan, so uh, we haven't used this IVL or OPM. Uh, so, what's the combination? Is it Okay to combine uh, like, like OA, uh, OAS plus IVL or load arterectomy plus IVL. Like after ablation, can you use IVL or OPM? Of and course, you can yes. use. Yes. Okay. You can use. If it's yes, uh, which combination is ideal? 
uh, I, that I'm curious. Actually, I go with what you said. I think it's lesion dependent. This is where your mm. judgment comes in. There is no okay. specific uh, one size fit all. It's just like a bifurcation standing the technique you mm -hmm. choose depending on what size sort of uh, lesion that you're dealing with. My take here is that because of a cost consideration, you want to choose a, a particular modality that you will deal with it one shot and not have a combination okay. because every time you put out a new device, it's a new cost. So shortwave costs 3,000 Singapore dollars. And, uh, okay. and and so if you take out one, you rupture, you take out another one. I mean, there's a lot of costs involved here. So I would like yeah. to choose one that will give me the uh, final uh, uh, lesion preparations that I can get and then to finish up with a stent. And also how mm -hmm. helpful is the OCT or IVAS in that kind of decision? Like, I think, uh, uh, yeah. I think image guidance will be very helpful mm -hmm. here. Tells me Thank the lesion uh, morphology, mm -hmm. the length of calcium, the thickness yep. and so forth. So I think it's very helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you use a lot of Orbito, uh, Gaku? Yes, uh, we, we are now using a lot uh, also. And uh, like you said, like a large vessel without angle. Sometimes it's angle, but uh, not, not very tight. But uh, it's a uh, good uh, indication for OAS, I think. But lot of victim is still, oh, we need that uh, in, in case of serious stenosis, long lesion, uh, like angulated lesion. I just want to add a I just want to add a comment on angulated lesions here, particularly uh, osteo circumflex. Now, when you have a very angulated lesion, orbital is no good in terms of advancing it in an integrate fashion. The best way to use orbital is to advance yes. it beyond the lesion and then do a retrograde pullback to do the ablation. Because if you go integrately, you find that the burr will be actually going against the left main, and there have been a couple of cases oh. of. Uh, left main pseudo aneurysm reported uh, with this anti-grade advancement of, uh, of uh, orbital arthrectomy. So I completely agree that we always uh, pull. Uh, Mr. Tan? Uh, yeah. Dr. I Tan, I suggest if you can please stop the screen share from your side. Okay. So I uh, just, uh, yeah, thank you, Wei Jing. I think uh, in view of time, we'll just uh, take a couple of questions actually from uh, VT Shah from Mumbai. Uh, his questions are about uh, uh, does uh, orbital help in calcified nodules or angulated lesions? I think you have already answered that. And the technique and RPM for stent ablation. Uh, so with the OAS, what do you think, uh, Wei Jing? So uh, in my opinion that, uh, you know, stent ablation, uh, you have to be very careful whether it is or orbital or rotational. Uh, you might have to be at a higher RPM in uh, not the lower. And I think if you're at a lower RPM, uh, where I think in Japan, you still have 40,000, where in the US, we don't have that. We have 80,000 and 120,000 uh, RPM for uh, orbital. So I would actually try to say that you should go slightly higher RPM if you are doing uh, stent ablation with the uh, orbital. And please beware that you may get stuck as, as it happened in the patient. And uh, that patient ideally should have received uh, <clears throat> emergency bypass. Even if the device was left, I think they should have done a distal uh, bypass to that uh, vessel. What do you think, Wei Qing? Well, the trouble know? is that he already had a bypass before. And so yeah. the surgeons are terribly reluctant to go in a second time <laughs> to retrieve a device right. uh, from the RCA. So, so that was the dilemma we had. So, so I think a great okay, session to I wrap up. I would like to leave. So bye-bye to all of you. It was a great session. Yes. Yeah, so I, I think, think uh, a fantastic way of approaching a calcified lesions, the different lesions that uh, presentations from all uh, uh, three uh, speakers, uh, Wei Chim, Dr. Shukset, and uh, uh, and uh, Tegu, uh, you know, half uh, rotational atherectomy. I have learned myself a new technique and I will start uh, applying that. Uh, we also have to be careful, as uh, I think Dr. Alfaredi mentioned, that uh, if you're really, or uh, I think Gaku, uh, very close to the distal wire, uh, maybe rotational wire fractures can happen, uh, especially if you're an angulated uh, lesion. So be careful not to uh, be very deep uh, with the rotational uh, device, atherectomy device. So, uh, and then I ask my co-moderator, Dr. Jack Tan, to make a few comments and then we can close the session. 
So I, I think it's late in the night. Uh, I think Asho is still having connectivity issues, uh, <laughs> worse than Basha, but uh, I think it was a wonderful session. I would just like to comment that I want to thank my speakers, the panelists, and the participants for their time tonight. Great questions coming in from the web, and uh, we hope we address most of the questions. Uh, a quick summary, I think there was a lot of concern, and I'm very glad we had this session about the use of this adjunct therapy, whether it's a scoring balloon or the high-pressure balloon. The main concern for the high-pressure balloon, if I may summarize, the concern about perforation, which if you use correctly, I think that is quite rare and is very safe. I'm happy that we have this adjunct of an OPN balloon. In regards to the algorithm, that was the other major questions uh, keep being asked. I think the algorithm really depends on your experience, your expertise, your availability. I like Hui Chim's uh, summary slide where it weighs the pros and cons and try not to use 110 adjuncts. I think it's good that uh, there is uh, options for you. I think Lipto, Tripsy, sorry, Rota, Tripsy, uh, OS, Tripsy, all these other combinations are now possible. And with more experience, we're doing more and more challenging subtypes. But just a uh, caution, like rightly put by Hui Chim, complication can happen. And in calcified lesion, if it does happen, it's terrible. So we also have to be uh, wary about the uh, complications uh, in these uh, cases. So uh, with that, uh, on behalf of uh, Professor Ashok and my co-moderator and all the speakers, uh, we thank you for your evening with us tonight. And uh, keep safe again during this COVID period. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.